the Memorial of St. Helena was the first and most powerful protest against an odious system of calumny and libel inspired by hatred and an abuse of victory. The Memorial caused a publication which on its appearance excited general curiosity in Europe to be forgotten. I refer to the manuscript which came from St. Helena in a manner unknown. At the time when this book was published, the mysterious way in which it reached England and had been addressed to the most celebrated bookseller in London, the strong desire to obtain revelations from Napoleon about himself, the disgust with the diatribes published against him, and finally the interest which was inspired by the greatness of his misfortune prepared a greedy reception for this alleged St. Helena manuscript. On the other hand, the anachronisms, the improbabilities, and the vulgar mistakes interspersed in pages full of lofty ideas and picturesque and characteristic expressions held the public mind in suspense. The anachronisms were explained by the statement that it had been necessary in order to rescue the sheets of the manuscript from the inquisition of the jailer of St. Helena to separate them and to send them to Europe by roundabout ways so that the confusion which had resulted therefrom had prevented their being put in their right order. Indeed, a proof of the authenticity of this book was seen in these very anachronisms because it was pointed out that no spurious author would have committed them. The mistakes about facts were attributed to the loss of several sheets of the manuscript which had to be rewritten by somebody else's pen. These explanations, good or bad, having been admitted, the book was generally considered to be the work of Napoleon himself, amongst persons whose functions had formerly put them in direct communication with him. Reflection, however, and a more careful examination of the manuscript very soon increased the doubts as to its authenticity. There were mention as having been its authors, first of all, Madame de Stael, then Benjamin Constant. The emperor himself attributed it to a counselor of state whom he did not name, who, according to his statement, had been on ordinary service under the consulate. Public opinion finally settled upon a relation of Count Simeon's, who's, who occupied a place in the financial department in the south of France. Count Simeon, being approached on the subject, admitted that his relation was responsible for the book. The secret which the true author of the book had kept was at last confided to his family. The manuscript of St. Helena, which appeared fated to remain enveloped in the mystery, which enshrouds to this day the letters of Junius and other historical writings and deeds whose authors or those who took part in them will probably remain unknown forever, was the pen of... Monsieur Frédéric Lulin de Chateau Vieux, a Genevese already known to the scientific world. This writer has admitted after keeping silent for 25 years that he wrote this book in 1816, that he carried it himself to London and posted it to Murray, the publisher. The draft of this little work entirely written by its author's hand and covered with his corrections was found amongst the papers after his death and Monsieur Simeon's cousin readily renounced a paternity, which people persisted in attributing to him. Napoleon had an inclination for various people who made their mark in the history of the century and amongst others for Monsieur de Talleyrand. The latter had foreseen the future elevation of General Bonaparte at the time when the Directoire had raised the former Bishop of Aton to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The First Consul and Emperor remembered this fact, and there perhaps lies the reason of the sympathy which Napoleon so long retained for Talleyrand. Even when guilty collusions, financial matters, and warnings given by foreign sovereigns obliged the Emperor to remove this minister's portfolio and to dismiss him from his councils, an instinctive liking drew him back towards him. In 1803, the emperor had asked the pope to secularize the former prelate, a feeling of propriety making him desire to see the latter in a position better suited to the worldly career which he had embraced. But it was not the same when Monsieur Talleyrand expressed to the head of the state his wish to marry 
The Empress Josephine, Mrs. Grant's friend, helped her with all her influence on the Emperor's mind. But Napoleon remained deaf to all her entreaties. Sometimes Josephine used to go up by the little staircase which communicated between her apartment and the Emperor's cabinet and would come and knock at the door. One day, being alone, I opened the door. She had come to tell Bonaparte that Madame Grant was there and to beg him to listen to her for a moment. Napoleon at last allowed himself to be influenced and went downstairs to his wife's rooms where he found Madame Grant in a suppliant attitude, imploring him with clasped hands not to put an obstacle in the way of her marriage. Napoleon could not resist a woman's tears and entreaties and promised to remain neutral, which was all he could do. The marriage took place but it was not destined to be a happy one. In 1810, when Talleyrand had lost between 14 and 1,500,000 francs in banker Simon's bankruptcy, the emperor, in spite of the fact that he had real grievances against his former minister, came to his assistance. He purchased the Monaco mansion, which Monsieur Talleyrand wanted to sell for two million and some hundred thousand francs. Now, in purchasing this house, Napoleon was acting against a rule which he had made of never buying houses or estates, which were expensive to keep up, for he had no need of such, seeing that the imperial domains and castles amply sufficed him. Napoleon also truly loved the Emperor Alexander, whom he found superior to the sovereigns of the day. The Tsar's wit, his grace, and his affability had charmed the Emperor. In spite of the most caressing demonstrations, it must be acknowledged today that the Russian monarch's affection for Napoleon was never sincere. As to the latter, he succumbed to the charm of the cunning Alexander in spite of all the strong reasons which he had to abandon his illusions. Napoleon had retained such feelings for this prince that he used to say that an hour's conversation would have sufficed to efface all traces of resentment between them. I witnessed at Tilsit and Erfurt the charming familiarity which existed between Napoleon and Alexander and the affectionate intimacy which manifested itself in their private and almost daily correspondence. I like to believe that amongst the causes of the profound melancholy which embittered the Tsar's last days were mingled some remembrances of the moment spent at Tilsit and at Erfurt and the picture of the agony of St. Helena. Napoleon, without putting aside the requirements of his general policy, was filled with condescension towards Alexander. The following incident will serve as an example, albeit it touches Napoleon's military glory as well as his politics. Having noticed that Alexander had retained a bitter remembrance of his defeat at Austerlitz, the victor ordered his cipher to be secretly removed from the bas reliefs on the column of the Place Vendôme, where it figured on the helmets and the breastplates of the Russian soldiers. The Tsar, on entering into Paris, had he paid attention to the matter, might have seen in the absence of this cipher a proof of the delicate generosity of his former ally. The excommunication fulminated in 1809 by the Pope, which had passed almost unnoticed at that time had not prevented the emperor's marriage, nor checked the discussion of the religious questions which were being dealt with in an ecclesiastical commission to which the examination of all litigious matters had been submitted. Towards the end of 1810, the emperor heard that this excommunication, as well as the papal bulls directed against the nomination of Cardinal Maury to the Archbishopric of Paris and against the dominations of two other bishops were in secret circulation. The bull of excommunication had even been clandestinely posted up during the night on the doors of Notre Dame. Abbe Destro, grand vicar to the chapter of Paris, was suspected of having a hand in this matter. 
the examination of this abbe's papers and his own confessions dispelled all doubts on this subject. But what irritated the emperor in the highest degree was to hear that Portalis, the counselor of state, son of the former minister of public worship, to whom had been extended the same kindness which the emperor had shown towards his father, had also received communication of these bulls in secret. At the first sitting of the Council of State, at which Napoleon presided, January 5th, 1811, he addressed Count Portalis in very severe terms, and after a sharp reprimand, ordered him to leave the room and banished him from Paris. At St. Helena, Napoleon blamed himself, and perhaps not without reason, for having humbled Monsieur Portalis too deeply in ordering him to leave the room. He said that he should have contented himself with severely blaming him before the whole council of state assembled. Placed between the severe necessity of denouncing his religion and his duties towards his sovereign, who had a right to demand unreserved fidelity from him, Monsieur Portalis's position was a difficult one. It is not my place to decide what he ought to have done to conciliate all. I was much exercised by Monsieur Portalis's disgrace. I had been employed with him at the Congress of Lunaville and at the Congress of Amiens, and our relations began under these circumstances, had been continued. I have even in my possession letters which he wrote to me from Berlin, where he was Secretary of Legation, letters which his assurances of friendship towards me are mingled with his expressions of devotion towards the Emperor. When he was recalled in 1813 and appointed first president to the imperial court at Angers, I made haste to go and congratulate him. The arrest of several prelates and canons, compromised by the papers which had been seized at the house of Dastro, the grand vicar, followed on the discovery of this religious conspiracy. On the day after the scene at the Council of State on January 6, 1811, the metropolitan Metropolitan chapter of Paris thought right to present the emperor with an address exposing its profession of faith in favor of the liberties of the Gallican Church and Bossuet's four propositions. The majority of the archbishops, bishops, and chapters of Italy adhered to the declaration of the Paris chapter. Napoleon, full of his great designs on Italy, had with a view to opposing an obstacle to the abuse of the papal authority convened a national council in Paris, whose apparent object it was to deliberate on the best means of providing for the canonical institution of nominated bishops. When the Pope refused to do this, his council, composed of more than 100 bishops of the churches of France and Italy, assembled on June 17th under the precedence of Cardinal Fesch. The emperor had reason to complain of the bad direction taken by this assembly. The council did not respond to his views, declared itself incompetent to decide the question of the institution of bishops, and proposed that a deputation should be sent to the pope to come to an understanding with his holiness on how the precarious state of the churches of France and Italy could be best remedied. Many French bishops, the archbishop of Bordeaux, amongst others, manifested ultramontane dispositions, contrary to the large majority of Italian bishops who showed themselves more independent of the court of Rome. When the emperor was informed that the council had determined to declare itself incompetent, he ordered it to be dissolved. The majority of the bishops reassembled some days later, and this time, admitting the competence of the council, discussed the principal points submitted to them for discussion and fixed it six months the period accorded to the Pope to confer canonical investiture on bishops after which this investiture was to be carried out by the Metropolitan or in his absence by the oldest bishop in the province without the Pope's interference. In the preceding month of January, the emperor had appointed an ecclesiastical commission composed of nine French cardinals, archbishops, and bishops for the purpose of settling these questions. This commission, after studying past history and basing its decision on precedence, expressed the opinion that the investiture 
of bishops who had been nominated to sees should be entrusted to the Metropolitan or to his suffragan in all cases where the Pope refused to act. This deliberation was carried out to the Holy Father by the Ecclesiastical Commission, to whom the Emperor had added Abbe and Mary, the superior of the seminary of St. Sulpice, whom he much esteemed. After long hesitation, the Pope finally adhered to this proposal. The National Council, in consequence, issued a decree in conformity therewith and charged a large deputation to carry the text of this decree to the Pope for his ratification. The Pope sanctioned the resolution adopted by the Council, but he imposed on the archbishops and bishops who were authorized to give the investiture the formal obligation of declaring that they were only acting in the Pope's name. Although the emperor's object of giving preponderance to the power and right of the national council over the papal authority and of opposing the former to the court of Rome was not altogether fulfilled since the Pope passing over the council's decision in silence appeared as the final authority. This first essay appeared nevertheless sufficient to Napoleon for the time being. The convocation of the second council in 1813, which would have completed the work of the first, was in the emperor's intention. But events occurred which prevented the realization of this plan. Napoleon at the same time treated three French bishops, two of whom were his almoners with rigor. They were arrested on the charge of having taken part in intrigues, of having corresponded illegally with the black cardinals and with Cardinal de Pietro, the clandestine agent of the papacy in France, and of having fomented rebellion amongst the clergy in underhand ways. These bishops were the bishops of Tournay, Ghent, and Troyes. The first of these prelates was not to be commended for the austerity of his morality. Napoleon had also to fight against the resistance of his uncle, Cardinal Fesch, who could not be charged with systematic opposition against his nephew, but who disapproved of his open struggle with the Holy See. The emperor's essay, accordingly, was only partially successful in this first council, and the majority of the upper clergy took advantage of it to preach opposition to the government. The advice of Barat. Archbishop of Tours, and especially of Duvoisin, Bishop of Nantes, on whom Napoleon had entire confidence, prevented the emperor's anger from breaking out on those who opposed him. The Bishop of Nantes, Napoleon used to say, was for him in theological matters a torch of which he did not wish to lose sight. The emperor allowed himself to be guided by this prelate's advice and checked himself whenever the bishop of Nantes warned him that he was about to injure the faith or damage the interests of the Church of France. Napoleon has been blamed for not having allowed any writing or publication either for or against the negotiations of ecclesiastical affairs to appear in the Moniteur. Such a polemic was... As a matter of fact, opposed to his views, he was not vexed that public opinion should be lulled to sleep or even should go astray. Convinced as he was, it would come back to his side when the time for carrying out the plan which he was meditating. Napoleon has stated in his memoirs that he never wished to publish anything connected with his discussions with Rome. Things were not in a sufficiently advanced state for him to allow anything official to be published. He endured discussions, which he looked upon in the light of skirmishing preliminary to the decisive battle that was to be fought. But he did not want these to be made public because he feared to reveal his private opinions and thus to compromise the success which he hoped to obtain. The emperor used to say that in depriving the pope of his temporal domain, his object was to fortify and honor his spiritual power. The pope seemed so necessary to Napoleon that he used to say that if he did not exist, he would have to be created. But he wished to have him in his hands and to establish him in Paris so as to make this capital the metropolis of the Catholic world. In placing the Holy See in the capital of the empire, Napoleon would have surrounded it with magnificence and honors, but at the same time, he would always have kept the pope under his eyes. This vast ambition was a permissible one. 
and he would perhaps have had the power and the genius necessary for realizing it. The establishment of the sovereign pontiff in Paris would have been fruitful and great political results, and the influence exercised by the head of the church over the whole Catholic world would have been the inheritance of France. That was the time of mighty conceptions and the generations which shall follow us in reading over the history of Napoleon will believe themselves transposed to the heroic ages. To sum up, Napoleon loved his religion and wished to honor it and render it prosperous. This is proved by the Concordat. But at the same time, he wished to employ it as a social force with which to repress anarchy, to consolidate his preponderance in Europe, and finally to increase the glory of France and the influence of the French capital. The emperor used to say that the bishop of Nantes, who pointed out to him how useful and how important for the unity of the faith was the visible head of the church, Master Bishop, be without anxiety. The policy of my states is closely bound up with the preservation and maintenance of the Pope's spiritual power. It is necessary to me that he should be more powerful than ever. He will never have as much power as my policy prompts me to desire for him.